Good morning, everyone. Take your Bibles to Judges chapter 1, be the text of our lesson. Um, we'll just read a verse and give the invitation since Mike's already preached to us, and we'll be out of here today. I appreciate your song choice. That song will go right along with our lesson, Judges chapter 1. Somebody's probably told you something before. You've probably heard some news that just kind of made you sad, things that just kind of upset your day. I'm sure it's happened to you. You might have been having a really good day, and then somebody told you something, and you're like, well, that just ruined my entire day. Something like that happened to me not long ago, not in a real bad way, but uh, within the last year, Morgan and I had a, a white SUV that we decided to sell and buy us a larger SUV, and it was my job to get the car ready to sell. So my job was to clean it up, vacuum it, wash it, get the windows looking clean and clear as they could be. I'd just finished up doing all the chores of cleaning the car. I'd washed it. I'd gotten the tires looking just right. You know, they were shining. You could see them from the end of the road. And, you know, that stuff you put on the tires is a little uh, slippery. It makes your hands not have so much grip. And I was cleaning the window, the windshield in the front. And I had taken, and I was going above and beyond. I even took the windshield wiper blades off of the wipers, and I was cleaning the blades themselves. I wanted everything to look just right. But when I took one of the blades off, the U-shaped metal handle slipped out of my hand, hit the windshield, and a crack went up that whole windshield. Now, my, my plan was to take pictures of that car that afternoon. It started off as a small star-shaped crack, but over the course of a couple of days, it went from the top to the bottom. So not only did we sell a car, but we bought a new windshield for it before we sold it. And that just kind of, you know, it was one of those things that you were going through the day, everything was going well, and then even though it's not a big deal, it just kind of ruined my day. Sad things that you may read or you may hear or sad things may happen to you occasionally, and uh, they're just kind of, they put a damper on things. Now, the majority of the Bible is especially positive. You find so many instances in the scriptures, especially the New Testament epistles, epistles, where Paul and other writers tell us that our outlook on life ought to be positive. But the Bible is not delusional in the fact that it only shares what's good and right. The Bible also shares to us the dangers of life, and it shares us the difficulties when they happen. Even if they were challenging, the Bible doesn't stop to share with us the reality of the way things were. Two Old Testament passages come to my mind when I think of difficult, sad passages that, in other words, everything was very positive, but when you read these passages, it presented a very negative outlook. One of them is found in 1 Kings chapter 18. We're not going to necessarily turn there. We just studied this passage a few months ago in the story of Elijah. But when Elijah on first, in 1 Kings 18 is on Mount Carmel battling the prophets of Baal, the prophets of Baal begin to cry out from the time the sun comes up until noon to Baal, asking him to answer their prayer. And in two of the saddest verses in the Bible, the text indicates to us that as they cried out, there was no one listening, no one cared. Now, there's a lot of people in our world today that feel that way. As they cry out, they feel as if no one listens and no one cares. That's the reality of a false god. There's no one there to listen, and no one cares. But there's a God of the Bible that does listen, and Elijah showed us that. That's a sad verse in the Bible. Another sad verse, which is going to be in the context of our study this morning, is found in Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. In Judges chapter 2 and verse 10, we're going to get to this verse in our study. You read a verse about what happened after the leadership of Moses and Joshua. You remember Moses died not being allowed to go into the promised land. And Joshua took over leadership. And when Joshua came to the end of his life, he died. And here's what the Bible says about that. Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. And all that generation, this is talking about Joshua the son of Nun and all his servants. All that generation was gathered to their fathers. And there arose another, another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. Of all the verses in the Bible that are sad, I believe this is one of the saddest. After Joshua and his leaders died, there arose a generation that did not know God. Now you've got to understand the context of this before we dive into Judges chapter 2 to ask the question, why did this group not know God? Why had they forgotten the Lord? But in order to get to that point, we have to remember the context of the people of Israel. They, through the leadership of Joseph, began to grow in the city of Egypt. But over time, a new pharaoh rose up that did not know Israel and God's people. And that pharaoh enslaved the people of Israel and made them slaves for hundreds of years. Eventually, God heard the cry of the Israelites and he came to Moses. 
in the wilderness in a burning bush and said, Moses, I want you to go rescue my people out of Israel, I've heard, or out of Egypt, my people Israel. I've heard their cry, and I'm ready to rescue them. So Moses goes in, he rescues the people of Israel, he brings them out. Through a series of unfortunate events that take place, ultimately they wander in the, year, uh, in the wilderness for 40 years. But eventually, Moses dies and Joshua leads the people of Israel into the promised land of Canaan. Now, you could study Joshua. We're not going to do that this morning. But in Joshua chapters 1 through 12, you read about them taking the promised land, which is exactly what God wanted them to do. He had this land promised for them. And Joshua leads the people through there. There was a lot of land to conquer. And you don't get all the context in Joshua 1 through 12. But you do read a lot of stories about how they conquered the promised land, and they took the cities that they conquered, and God was with them, and God led them through the promised land. At the end of the book of Joshua, Joshua 23 through 25, Joshua, the son of Nun, God's leader over Israel, he dies. And after he dies, the Bible tells us that they weren't quite done conquering the land of Canaan. And that's where we pick up in Judges chapter 1. The people of Israel still had much land to conquer. They still had a lot of ground to cover, and their leader, Joshua, had died. Now, there were some very specific instructions that God had given the people of Israel. I want to read those briefly. We're not going to put these verses on the screen. I'm just going to read them out loud to you, and you'll see that the people of Israel did not follow what God said. This is Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you're entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them. You shall show no mercy to them. You shall not intermarry with them. Give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me and serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you, and he would destroy you quickly. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall break down their altars, dash in pieces their pillars, and chop down their ashram, and burn their carved images with fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God shall choose you to be a people for his treasured possession, and out of all the people who are on the face of the earth. God's instructions to Israel were clear. Go into the promised land. Don't marry them. Don't make covenants with them. Get rid of their gods and drive them out of the land. Or when you live among them, you will become one of them. Judges chapter 1. We could begin in verse 27. Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Sheen and its villages. Verse 29 Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer, so the Canaanites lived in Gezer among them. Verse 30, Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants. Verse 31, Asher did not drive out the inhabitants. Verse 33, Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants. Verse 34, the Amorites pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down into the plain. Everything God had told the Israelites to do, they failed to do. And there arose a generation that did not know God and did not know his ways. What led to a generation being raised up who did not know God? Let's begin in Judges chapter 2 and verse 1. Number one reason. Judges chapter 2 and verse 1. Why did a generation rise up that did not know God or his ways? They had forgotten what God had taught them. Verses 1 and 2 of Judges chapter 2. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum and said to him, I brought you up from Egypt and I brought you into the land that I swore to give you to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of their land. Does that sound familiar? You shouldn't have made a covenant with them, Israel. You shall break down their altars. Does that sound familiar? God already said it in Deuteronomy 7. But... You have not obeyed my voice. What is this that you have done? 
God made his instructions to the Canaanite or to the Israelites regarding the Canaanites and the Jebusites and all these people that God had sent the Israelites in to conquer. He made his instructions clear. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, don't, don't, don't. If you don't do what I say, you'll become one of them. And what is the number one accusation made against the people of Israel? You did not heed what I said. You did not listen to the words that I taught you. Moses' leadership in the wilderness, Israel, their experience in the wilderness, all the things they had seen God do, and they failed to obey what he said. Because of their lack of regard for the will of God, the people of Israel fell. God's people today will fall if we disregard the will of God. God's word is clear. God's will is clear. We can understand God's will in the New Testament. We have what God would desire for us to do. But if we disregard the will of God, there may be a danger that a generation could rise up that does not know the Lord. God's will is clear. Just a couple of things that God's will teaches us in our New Testament day. One is the necessity of faithfulness. The necessity of faithfulness. It is a sad reality that so many people live their life in a way that their arm has to be twisted in order to faithfully serve God. But the Bible tells us time and again, like in 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2, it is required of a steward that he be found faithful or that he be found trustworthy. You and I, as servants of God, must be faithful to him. But oftentimes our faithfulness is connected to the visibility of our actions. I will be faithful as long as I am visible. But when I am no longer visible to the people, my faithfulness wanes. But God would command us to be faithful. His teaching is, as stewards, we would be faithful. The life you live is something that we're simply managing for God. So as stewards, we should live our life faithfully. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 26 says, What would a man give in exchange for his soul? Would he give the whole world in exchange for his soul? Would he give up his soul for all the possessions and the wealth and the notoriety of the world? For what will a man profit if he gains the whole world and he forfeits his soul? This question has been raised by many of us over the years. You've probably thought of this verse before. What would a man give in exchange for his soul? You probably look around in the world and you see people who have given away their soul for the things of this world. They've left it up to the devil's wiles so that they could have what possessions they could have in this world. But so often, that disguises itself among us as well. You know, it is among the people who just live blatantly against God. But it also disguises itself among us. That our priorities would not be in line. That the affairs of this world would occupy the bulk of our time. And God's work would live in the rubble of our negligence. And so, you and I must be serious about God's will. He, he asks us to be faithful. God desires that our priorities be set correctly. God, God desires for us to share the story of Jesus. That's exactly what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, that we would share the word with others, that they could share it with others as well. So you and I must heed to the will of God. Why did a generation rise up that didn't know God? Because the people did not heed God's will. Now it should frighten, it frightens me, and it should maybe raise our awareness that in the case of Joshua, Israel was slaves. Then they were under the leadership of Moses. Then they were under the leadership of Joshua. And then a generation rose that did not know God. Now, depending on how you count the words of the end of the book of Joshua, it is anywhere from three to four generations from God's people Israel reviving themselves to faithfulness and, and waning away and forgetting him. It's important that every generation, every group of people exalt the will of God. So they rose up a generation that did not know God because they had forgotten what God had taught them. Okay, let's go on to verses 6 through 11 of Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2 verses 6 through 11 when Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. 
And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance. Um, verse 10, And all that generation also gathered to their fathers. There arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord of the work that he had done for Israel. Verse 11, And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Now, a verse that I want to key on in here as we talk about our second point of why a generation rose up that did not know God is verse 7 of Judges 2. The people that served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel, that had seen all all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. Number two, the first reason that a generation rose up that didn't know the Lord was because they did not talk about what God said. God said this, and this is the way we ought to live, and this is what God has commanded us. They didn't bring that up, so a generation rose up that didn't know that. Number two, this is what God did for us. Now, we have memorials in our family. I'm sure some of you may have photo books at home that have the generations of your family that have lived. And maybe you have stories for each one of those photos. And maybe uh, we don't do this as much because we consume so much as it is, so many stories about other people. But we need to be sharing, as probably some of you do, the stories of our heritage, the people who have come before us in our family, the knowledge that they had and the things that they experienced, that they had to endure. We share those things with people. We like to sit around. As I've gotten older and I've understood how the, word works, the world works more, I'm more interested in hearing the stories from my grandparents than I was when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I wish I'd have had the smarts to listen up because they shared some pretty cool things and they knew some pretty neat things that I wish I could retain up here. The stories of the generations before us are important and they're important when they come from Christian men and women. This is how faithful God has been to us. This is what God has done for us. This is the God of the Bible. And you can trust him because we watched and we learned we could trust him. Don't you think that's what should have been told in the homes of the people of Israel? You'll never believe it. The water stood up. The Egyptians were chasing us. And the water stood up at the command of Moses. And Moses told us that God told him to do that. And God saved us. And you'll never believe, we walked across on dry land at the bottom of that sea. And then we got to the other side and we turned around and here came the Egyptians. And then the waters fell and God saved us. Not only is it important for us to talk about what God has said. But we must constantly remind ourselves and the people around us of what God has done. He fed us in the wilderness. We didn't have any want. Yeah, we got tired of manna, okay? And yeah, God provided us more. And yeah, things were different. But you know what? Our clothes never wore out. You'll never believe it. I wore the same shoes for 40 years. God took care of us. We came in, and we crossed over the river, and we come to Jericho, and Jericho could easily see us. And we could easily see them, but God commanded that we observe some of his memorial. And we sat down and observed that memorial. And Jericho watched us and we watched them. And then God gave us victory. The beautiful works of God. How does a generation forget God when the generation before him doesn't talk about God? How do you and I forget the works of God when we don't remind ourselves of them day after day after day. They had forgotten what God had done. Verse 7, All the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. It's obvious to me that those great works were not shared. David speaks of them. He calls them God's wonders. He tells us that you and I should marvel at the wonders of God. And the people of Israel had failed, failed to do so. And so a generation rose up that was uh, a generation that didn't know God, and they did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals. Now let me ask you a question. How could a generation rise up that would turn to a set of gods that could not provide for them? How did Elijah come to a state where he looked around and all the people served a God that when they cried out to him, never answered. No one listened. No one cared. There was no one there to hear what they said. 
How does a generation rise up that turn to a god or a set of gods that cannot do anything for them? And maybe it may be that the God of the Bible who did things for them was never shared with them. So because they had never heard of the greatness of God, they did evil in the sight of God, and they turned to false gods, things that could not actually provide for them. Maybe when they got to those lands, as God told them, when you come and you live in houses you didn't build, and you drink from wells you didn't dig, and you eat from vineyards you didn't plant, and you didn't work those vineyards, you're going to forget me, and if you do, things are going to be very bad. And that's exactly what they did. They had all the provisions they could ever want, and in their mind, I would imagine, they said, well, what do we need God for? Look, we're, we're well provided for. And all these neighbors that we didn't drive out told us it was Baal that did it. So look what Baal has done for us. And God's works were not Shared. They had seen the river part with their own eyes. They had seen the walls of Jericho crumble. They had seen thing after thing after thing after thing. And yet those things were not shared from generation to generation. So the next generation rose up. They didn't know those things. Many of God's children today may do the same thing. Now, we don't have golden statues and, you know, there's not an altar out back. You can check, but I promise you there's not one. There's not an altar out back, and we're not going to kill an animal and put it on there and sacrifice it. Okay? I'm not going to make each one of you bring an animal in on a Sunday, right? I'm not going to be like the money changers in the temple and overcharge you for it. Okay? They, said they just had dollar signs in their eyes. We're not going to do any of that because that's the Old Testament way. But when we talk about altars and gods and false gods and, and statues, you and I still have our, we still have our false gods today. Now, I don't have to explain. You know exactly what they are. You can probably look into your heart and see which one you may have served before or one that has your attention today. So the thing that happened is that they had stopped sharing what God had done. So let's look at verses 11 through 13, and we'll conclude with an invitation. Verses 11 through 13. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord and the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them, and bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. Verse 13. They abandoned the Lord. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. They followed after other gods. They served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. If you do a little bit of research into the Canaanite gods, this is a, a, an environment in which it would probably not be appropriate to share all the things that the Canaanite gods required their people to do, but they're terrible. And if you ever do any biblical research on the Old Testament pagan gods, you'll be floored. It puts really a lot of what Hollywood puts out there to shame what they did. It was crazy. And the people of Israel bought into all that junk. And they followed after those gods, and they abandoned the Lord. They had forgotten who God was. All of, the necess all of the necessary activities of our lives must fall under the umbrella of serving and glorifying God. And for Israel, that was no longer true. They had forgotten God. But the Bible tells us still today, you and I have been created for the purpose of honoring and glorifying God. Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 7 says that you and I were created to glorify Him. To bring glory to his name. And if that is our purpose, turning to things that are not God is not what God is pleased with. And it does not bring him glory. And so, the people of Israel, they came into the promised land. And a generation rose up that did not know God. From Judges chapter 2 verses 1 through 13, we learn that that happened for three reasons. Number one, they had stopped talking about what God had said. Number two, they stopped talking about what God had done. And because of that... They forgot God. Or as the ESV rendered it, they abandoned God. You and I must be about the business of talking about what God has said, talking about what God has done, and always keeping the Lord as the focus of our actions and service today. And if that be the case, if our devotion for God be strong, if we be serious about what He said and what He's done, that will naturally pass to the next generation. And a generation will not rise up that does not know God. And a generation will not rise up that abandons God. They will grow up knowing the, the works and the wonders of God. Maybe something has happened in your life before that has disappointed you. Like the windshield thing. I was mad as a hornet. I was just tore up about it. But I realized it wasn't really a big deal. It wasn't the end of the world. Things could have been a lot worse. And for many of us, the situations in our life, we could say, things could be a lot worse. I could, I could be in a lot worse situation but when it comes to sin, when it comes to my relationship with God, 
If I'm separated from him, there's nothing worse. And if I need to come to him, we have an invitation set this morning that it's an opportunity for you to do so. Now, of course, the Lord's invitation is always open. But right now, the invitation is open. We're going to sing a song here in just a moment. When we sing that song, we'll all stand and the front pews are open. If you need to respond to the invitation by coming to become a child of God. If you've walked away and abandoned God and you want to come back to him in repentance, you can do that during this time. If you need the prayers of the church for encouragement. Whatever the case is, this time is the invitation. The invitation is extended to you. And if you need to come, please do so as we stand and sing.